Jam 2024-16. In a two-player game, player one can choose M or N. Player two can choose X, Y, or Z. The payoff matrix is as follows. So I can see that one zero is less than two one. So this will be completely dominated. Yeah. So this is what it is. This is dominated by this. Secondly, if you take a look at zero is less than one, minus one is less than 0. 0.5. So this will be completely dominated. And N goes for Y, N goes for Z. So one comma three, this is what will be the equilibrium here. So one comma three is the strategy profile that is surviving the iterated elimination. So N Y will be the answer here. That's option A. Let's take a look. It's option A here. Yeah, this is okay. IIT Jam 2024, question number 17. For a profit maximizing monopolist, the ratio of the profit margin to price, also known as the learner index or the relative markup, has a relationship with the price elasticity of demand at the profit maximizing price. Then which of the following statement is correct? Now, what is the learner's index? The learner index is the markup that uh, the monopolist is able to charge. The index is price minus the marginal cost divided by the price, which in the case of a monopolist is nothing but one by the elasticity of demand. Okay. Right. So analyzing the options. So you take a look at the options here. The options that you see here, A, B, C, and D. Look at the first option. First option is the larger the elasticity of demand at the profit maximizing price, the greater is the relative markup. This is incorrect. As you can see, it's one by elasticity of demand. That is why it is inversely related to the elasticity of demand. A higher elasticity means a lower markup. Take a look at option B. The power to sustain a price higher than the marginal cost depends on the profit maximizing price. This is again incorrect because the power to set a higher price than the marginal cost depends on the price elasticity of demand, not just the profit maximizing price. C, at the profit maximizing price, given costs are greater than zero, the price elasticity of demand is strictly larger than unity. This is correct. For a monopolist to maximize profit, the elasticity of demand must be greater than one, as setting the prices with inelastic demand would not maximize my profit. Okay. In fact, if you uh, remember the profit maximizing condition of a monopolist, the profit maximizing condition of a monopolist is as follows. Marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Marginal revenue is P into 1 minus 1 by elasticity. Now, if it is inelastic, this, this part becomes negative. So, inelastic demand is impossible for a monopolist. Answer is C. Let's also take a look at option D. What is option D saying? At the revenue maximizing price, the price elasticity of demand is greater than unity. This is incorrect. At the revenue maximizing price, the price elasticity of demand has to be exactly equal to one. Okay. Not greater than one. Exactly equal to one. At the revenue maximizing price. Okay. So answer here is option C for 17. Okay. Jam 2024, question number 18. To study the effect of X1 and X2 on Y, the following regression model is estimated. Okay. Using a large sample. So it's a large sample. This is the regression equation. The estimates are given and the standard error is also given. Now, two things to analyze. Let's talk about the Z, the T statistic. In case of alpha, it's the statistic divided by the standard error, which is equal to 2. For beta 1, it is 0.39 by 0.13, which is equal to 3. 
and beta 2 the t statistic is 1.8 divided by 1 which is 1.8 now for a large sample the critical values i'm talking about the critical values of t at the 10 percent level sorry level i call this level of significance the value since it's a large uh, sample it will get to the standard normal variate 10 percent level it is 1.645 5 percent here 5 it's a two-tailed test all the tests of significance in econometrics is a two-tailed test 1.645 5 percent value will be 1.96 1% value will be 2.33. Okay. These are the three values that you have here. Okay. Sorry, not 2.33. It's 2.575. That's 2.58, if I can call it. This is a two variable. Sorry. For 1%, it is 2.58. For 2%, it would have been 2.33. So these are the values. Now, alpha, which is Two, this will be significant at 5% and 10%. 3 is significant at all levels, 1, 5 and 10. If it is significant at 1, it is automatically significant at 5. Because 3, if it is greater than 2.58, it's automatically greater than 1.96, it's automatically greater than 1.645. 1.8 is significant only at the 10% level. So significant at 5%, 1%, and 10% levels. Okay. So what will be the answer? Let's take a look at the options here first. So let's take a look at the options. Alpha is statistically significant. 1% no at 5% and 10%. 1% no. 5% yes. Beta 1 at 1% yes. Beta 2 at 10% yes. This is the answer. 5% beta 1 is significant at 1, 5 and 10, all of them. Beta 2 is significant at 10%. Answer C here. I hope this is understandable. It's very easy. It only requires you to remember the significant values at the 10%, 5% and 1% and how to find out the T statistic in the case of alpha, beta 1 and beta 2. Any parametric it's like this. So for parameter alpha, the T value will be alpha hat by standard error alpha hat. Similarly for beta 1, similarly for beta 2, similarly for any parameter. If I need to test for significance, this is the test that I need to do. Okay. Here the answer is C. IIT Jam 2024 question number 19. Suppose high quality and low quality products are sold at the same price to the buyers. The buyers have less information to determine the quality of the product compared to the sellers at the time of purchase. Okay. This is quite a realistic problem. An example would be the used car market. Just by looking at a car, you uh, cannot actually say uh, whether the quality of the car that you are going to purchase is it a good quality or a bad quality car which of the following problem arises in this situation where you don't know the quality whether it is a good or a bad quality it leads to adverse selection okay the selection can be adverse it's not a moral hazard problem it's not a market signaling problem it's not a principal agent problem Right. To explain why the other options are incorrect, let's take a look at option A. Moral hazard arises after a transaction when one party has an incentive to take more risks because of the negative consequences will be borne by the other party. Okay. So I will take on more risk because the consequences are being borne by the other party. Like for example, after buying an insurance, an individual might act uh, recklessly since they know that the insurer will be covering the losses. Okay, that's an example of a moral hazard problem. 
now a market signaling occurs when one party typically the seller sends a signal to convey private information to the other party typically the buyer to reduce information asymmetry an example is an employee using educational qualification to signal their skills to the employers that's a market signaling problem why is this incorrect because uh, there is no question of a selection in this principal agent problem occurs when an agent who acts on behalf of the principal has incentives that are misaligned with those of the principal leading to inefficiencies an example would be a manager or an agent may not work as hard as the owner wants because the manager's incentives are different so these are options a b and c an adverse uh, selection on the other hand occurs due to asymmetric information where one party usually the seller knows more about the quality of the product than the other party who is the buyer buyers unable to tell the difference between the high quality and the low quality products may either refuse to buy or end up buying the lower quality product at the same price as the higher quality one so that is why d is my answer here iit jam 2024 question number 20 so individuals who were either unemployed or out of labor force but had worked for at least 30 days over the reference year were included in the labor force by the nsso in its labor force surveys under which one of the following classification does the above procedure appear okay so let's take a look at the options here so option a is usual principal status okay this uh, status classifies individuals based on their principal activity over the reference year if someone was unemployed or out of the labor force for the majority of the year they would not be included in the labor force under this classification why is this incorrect because this option doesn't account for short term employment like 30 days alongside being out of the labor force for most of the year now let's take a look at option b usual principal and subsidiary status this is the correct answer here because of the fact that now because the nsso use uh, uses multiple uh concepts in order to classify individuals based on their employment status over a reference period let's break this option down okay usual principal and the subsidiary uh, status this classification considers individuals who may not have been employed for most of the year but have worked for at least 30 days okay if an individual's principal activity status is non employment but they worked in a subsidiary activity for at least 30 days they are still counted in the labor force under this classification okay that is why b is the correct answer c is incorrect because this current weekly status measures employment based on activity during a 7 day reference period this question is for a reference period of a year not for a week so this is incorrect current daily status is employment on a daily basis over the reference period so this question doesn't concern day to day activity but focuses on employing lasting at least 30 days over an entire year so obviously d is also incorrect answer here is b okay